Welcome, everybody. It's the bros are back, the lovers of tourism, the lovers of Canada, and we're back in action from our little bit of a break in August. And we are now welcoming you back live in the A Canada Travel Studio for episode 70 on the A Travel Talk Show. This is brought to you by the ACanadaTravel.com and the A Travel Marketing Group. Summer. What a summer. Wherever you lived in our great land, we had a very different summer. But it was an opportunity for us here at A Canada to do some maintenance on our Cobro satellite. You've heard about it, regular viewers of this show, the Cobro satellite. It's our Gorilla Goo duct tape satellite out there in the world that is beaming our show down to the world every Tuesday at noon Pacific time. The Cobro satellite is working just fine as you can see so some you can catch this a travel talk show live with us like you are now or you can watch this at a later date which most of you and some of you and the shy ones and then the other ones will want to do you can watch this later on facebook twitter instagram lincoln social media pages so yes everybody we are back live we will be sharing this for you all over the format all over with the cobro satellite beaming down a very strong signal my name is greg gerard and this who is not on the show yet will be colin gerard and he will be joining us in just a second we are what you would call the brothers of tourism we are your maple leaf wearing maple syrup guzzling moose loving beaver hugging canadian tourism hosts of the A Travel Talk Show. There he is, my brother. Colin That's we as including both of us. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So tonight, we have a great show for you. It's going to be in a wonderful show. It's going to allow us to connect back with our audience. It's going to allow us, through our guest tonight, is going to share with you the importance of connections of nature, people in this great country tonight. Yes, tonight, our guest. The great Diane Whelan is a trailblazer in filmmaking and yes. exploring. Diane is an award-winning Canadian filmmaker, photographer, author, and public speaker. And you guys sit back, grab that popcorn, grab that bannock, sit back, get excited. We're going to get educated a little bit about how beautiful this big country is. So her first film call. Yeah. Is really her first film. When I did a little bit of check it, because you know we we like to do a little snooping here, and we want to research sure is good. Research is good. Her first film was the High Canadian Art. It was a film called This yeah. Land in the High. And I took a little boo. I didn't get to to watch it, but I got a little snippets here and there, and I watched it. And boy, oh boy, it it it's amazing. But then, then there was Mount Everest in a movie called <laughs> Forty Days at Base Camp. Well, put that on your bucket list, Canadians. Uh, that's a huge one. That's a great one. And they're all huge and they all come with a different perspective. But it's the perspective of Diane Whelan, who is a lover of people and a lover of the earth. So this is very important for us. We're very excited on her mm -hmm. coming on this show, talking about her epic six year journey on the longest trail in the world, Canada's Trans Canada Trail or aka the great trail it all depends <laughs> on who you're talking to nowadays so that will also come on so what we would like to do is today we want to make sure you meet this canadian role we want you to connect with her and talk about what she has done in her anticipated upcoming indie film 500 days in the wild which documents her connection to the earth and its people using adventures along the Canada's 24,000 kilometer trail, the longest trail. So let we what we would like to do now, everybody, is we are going to welcome Diane to the show. Diane, we are so excited to have you, and we're really excited that she is able to join us today on our show. Welcome to the show, Diane. Thank you. <laughs> it's nice to be here with you two brothers. Excellent. Excellent. So it's an honor to have you, Dad. Yes. It's an honor to have you on the uh, show. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, too. So, Diane, uh, for our viewers now and in the future, when we yeah. put this throughout the system, maybe what you could do uh, for our audience is maybe share a little bit about who is this trailblazer we call Diane Whelan. 
Well, uh, thank you. I'm not exactly what you would consider to be your conventional trailblazer. Uh, I left on this journey just after turning 50, and I am an artist. So uh, it, it really wasn't about some major athletic achievement for me. Um, and, or, and, you know, but I do love adventure films. I've always loved adventure ever since I read The Hobbit as a young child. And, and, uh, <laughs> you know, carried it around. And then uh, I think in a National Geographic or something, there was a, an article about Hillary and Tenzing sort of 20 years after the climb. And, and uh, I, I tore that picture out and put it in the Hobbit. And um, so, yeah, it, from a very early age that, you know, I've been called to the journeys and uh, certainly being a, a, a storyteller. Um, yeah. The adventure has been a beautiful way of weaving all the things that I love into one experience exactly um, yeah all my films are adventure films guys but um one of the things that's similar to them too is that they're also about traditional indigenous wisdom and uh science and technology working together to take people through danger to safety uh mm -hmm. nobody makes it up in the high arctic not even the canadian army without traditional indigenous uh inuit wisdom um when i traveled up north we did the most northern coastline of canada and I traveled, which is the northwest coast of Ellesmere Island. And I traveled with the Canadian yes. Army and Inuit elders. Wow. And we know when you hit a hurricane uh, up near the North Pole and it's minus 80, uh, all that high tech gear, that GPS and a satellite phone and all those things that mm -hmm. give us a sense <laughs> of safety out there, they stop working because batteries freeze <laughs> in the cold. And that's when you really need the traditional uh, wisdom of the people who have lived up there uh, for well, millennia. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And and that and that I can't even under, I couldn't even fathom the the stories you have from all your 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 adventures and your exploration. I mean, you I how do you fit that all in your head? I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can never tell. The reason why I write books, which I'll be doing as well for Five Hundred Days in the Wild, uh, I'll be writing a book and making a doc an independent documentary. Um, and the wonderful thing about doing both is that it enables more storytelling to happen, right? And uh, and sort of social media for that matter. I mean, um, you know, on a day to day over the last six years, when I could anyway, it was great to be able to share pictures and stories. For me, it wasn't about selling anything. I wasn't marketing anything. I was just sharing, sharing moments along the way uh, yeah. of people I met and uh, the kindness that was offered to me. Um, so, um, yeah, it was, it's been, a it's been an amazing journey uh, across this beautiful country mm -hmm. of ours. That's for sure. And your first film, the Arctic, this land that you filmed in the yeah. Arctic, and then you went on and you said, okay, let's do the Mount Everest at the 40 days in base camp. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. And then you said, Hey, let's, let's don't go small. Let's go big <laughs> and let's do a 24,000 kilometer great trail in your, in your upcoming feature film your indie feature film 500 days in a yeah. while so maybe what we could do is on your current film project which chronicles this journey mm -hmm. this massive journey really yeah. uh connecting with land the people um what what share us a little bit about how this came about and sure. where where you see it going sure greg i um well it came about i, I like to say um every good story has more than one beginning and i and 500 days in the wild is very much a case of a case in point uh back in the early 90s my mother came home one day and and she had this certificate from the that said trans canada trail on it and she had made a donation on behalf of our whole family to the making of this trail and she was really excited about it my mother's acadian uh, from New Brunswick and just thought one day this would be something she would like to do. And uh, so fast forward, you know, um, 20 years later, I guess that seed that she planted in me started to sprout. That was part of the reason why I wanted to do the trail. The other one was um, that, you know, I had, as you mentioned, made a film on, on the most northern coastline in the world and also on the highest mountain in the world. So the longest trail in the world seemed like a pretty good fit um yeah. I, uh, you know but also as an artist i really wanted to find a more inclusive story and for this land and um i know i'm really i love canada like both of you uh i i um i love this land and i love this country 
But I know that Canada is just one chapter in the storybook of this land. And um, originally when they made this trail, they wanted to make it to celebrate Canada's 150th birthday. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to celebrate that, but I wanted to also honor and pay my respects to the ancestors of this land. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I set out to do when I left on this journey. And yeah. um, I thought maybe, you know, we had lost our connection to nature and to the web of life. And um, so I went on this journey to search for lost wisdom and to, um, and to yeah, find that connection. I, yeah. you know, I tell people when we live in cities, uh, we live in places that we created. When we return to nature, we are back to the place that created us. So there's no nice. other way to get to know like yourself, it. you know, than to yeah. just, just than to spend some time with yourself. Back. Can we quote you on that? Yeah, absolutely. That's where we all came from, right? Yeah. The funny, the funny that there's like a couple really good one-liners in our pre-show that I wrote down too. So I mean, there's some. You've got you've got some really good lines. I mean, oh, yeah. I got that from my grandmother. She was the queen of the one-liners, right? Her, my yeah. favorite was uh, when she would tell you, "You don't see a hearse pulling a U-Haul." <laughs> <laughs> That was one of her great one-liners. But anyway, no. you know, yeah. it carried a lot of punch to it, though, right? When you thought no. about it for a while, you're right. Like, don't get caught up in worrying about the wrong things, right? Life no. is just yeah. a series of experiences, no. as you both no. know. You gave yeah. up a lot of stuff to just go out and live your life and have some experiences. So um, yeah. anyway, that was my grandma yeah. Wayland's great advice to me. Anyway, don't see a hearse pulling a U-Haul, kid. I love it. <laughs> a wise woman. You know, I, there's woman. one there's one thing, hey, Colin and Diane, that I don't I don't think people realize what an undertaking this is. So uh, correct me mm. if I'm wrong, Diane, but I believe during this six year journey, you collected 470 hours of film. Yeah, you documented <laughs> 100 plus give or take journals. Yeah, and in that you must have collected a billion memories. So what my question is, this is. Out of this massive database of yeah. information you've collected, yeah. what what were some of the, the say the challenges you may encounter, and maybe yeah. some of those special memories which really resonate with you during this this epic journey? Well, Greg, they started right off in Newfoundland for sure. Uh, you know, I, I right from the beginning, um, everywhere I went. First of all, I'd like to just give, say that, you know, I did spend six years out there and not once did I ever meet anything but human kindness. Uh, I packed a right. lot of fear when I left because I was a woman camping alone and I was going to be doing things I'd never done before. So for sure, there was a lot of fear happening inside me. But after a while, I realized the fear that I had is the fear that I carried out with me <laughs> inside me uh that okay. it wasn't real it wasn't real it wasn't really out there mm -hmm. um um and some of the more i guess one of the first really standout experience i had uh you know apart from enjoying every single day in newfoundland was um uh, my first paddle as i mentioned uh, so it's a twenty-eight thousand kilometer trail for those who are new to the trans canada trail story um it connects three oceans the atlantic the arctic and the pacific and it has two mile zeros. One mile zero is in St. John's, Newfoundland, and the other mile zero is in Victoria, BC. Um, most people travel west to east. Um, I chose to travel east to west. Uh, That's interesting. Uh, it is interesting. Um, part the re you know, for me, I wanted to follow the sun as an artist. I loved the idea uh, of following the sun okay. back home. Nice. Uh, Newfoundland is also the place where my father, John Whalen, was born. My grandma, Mary Whalen, lived. My great grandmother, Hannah Whalen, was the midwife in St. John's. And my great uncle, Gus, died in a famous World War I battle called the ba Battle of Beaumont Hamill. So deep roots in Newfoundland. So it made sense mm -hmm. to start there for me personally and to make my way back home. But People like, I like to joke with people because uh, I, it also meant that I had a headwind the entire, <laughs> entire <life. laughs> uh -oh. But I never asked myself before I left on this journey, uh, D, what's the quickest way or what's the fastest way or what's the easiest way? Before mm -hmm. I left on this journey, what I sat with was uh, what is the most meaningful way? And so for me, following the sun and starting in the, in the land of my ancestors was the most meaningful way. Wow. 
Yeah. And, and so, yeah, go ahead, Carl. I was going to say, that's a great way to look at travel. Yeah, I think. Uh, you yeah. know, what's the most meaning? I mean, what's the most sorry. meaningful way, right? What's, I mean, in great. terms of creating a connection and experience. So, getting back to your question, though, Greg, which is, you know, some of the more memorable experiences. When I got to Cape Breton, I paddled, which most people don't realize is the Bredore Lake is the largest inland sea in the world. Okay. In the wow. world. And it's here in Canada. Unbelievable. Nice. Anyway, I had a, uh, it's a 400, I think it's a 400 kilometer paddle. I can't remember the exact numbers now. And um, <laughs> it took me 40 days. I do know that. And uh, and it was my first solo paddle. So it was a lot to learn on that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. Anyway, I think I was out there about uh, 11 days when um, I had my first experience with a, a strong offshore wind. The wind started getting kind of weird, actually. I was paddling along the coastline and all of a sudden this big wind came and pushed me into shore and I got out of the canoe and, uh, oh, there's a huge cliff right there, a sand cliff. And my eye saw this beautiful red rock sticking in the cliff. And so I went over to it and I dug it out and I, you know, washed it off in the water and I looked at it and I'm like, oh, wow, what a beautiful red rock. And I put it in my pocket. Mm -hmm. started walking towards my canoe noticed the winds were changing okay great i can take off and just before i started paddling i thought to myself hey you know d maybe you should leave this this rock here i was like no and another voice in my head probably yeah. <laughs> call him from the hobbit or something went no, <laughs> yeah. so anyway off i went with this red rock in my pocket and uh, i was in the area near Escasoni, which so quite a few communities around the Bredor lake or Mi'kmaq communities as well okay. as gaelic and irish and acadian it's like the it's quite amazing actually so i was very close to Escasoni at this point of time which is a Mi'kmaq community Anyway, I started paddling again, and no sooner did I get in that canoe and the winds changed, and instead of blowing me into the shore, they started blowing me out into open water. And uh, I soon found myself in a lot of trouble, and I realized this could be the, you know, could be the end for D here on this uh, yeah. being pushed out into open water moment. And all I could think about, you know, was like the, I, I, my paddle wasn't even touching, like the winds picked up, uh, the waves were coming from two directions. And all I could think about was, oh, my God, I shouldn't have taken that rock. <laughs> <laughs> I about that. But that's all I could think about. Right. Anyway, I made it across through some great fortune. Um, I can't really say it was my expertise. That's for sure. And uh, when I made it, it took I did about a 10 mile open water crossing. I hit the shore. And then um, I got out and I sat there for a while and just sort of reflected on what I had just learned on yeah. this, in this moment uh, on this day. And uh, one, of course, was to pay more attention to the wind. Uh, <laughs> that's the obvious one. But the next one, which stayed with me for the rest of the trip, which is, I guess, why I'm, I'm going to share it with you, was it, it made me re-examine the idea of what it means to be an explorer. And um, I realized that, um, that, that maybe exploring wasn't about taking things, you know, it was about listening. And so I returned the rock to the water and back to the land it came from. And from that moment on, I just said, you know, um, I came out here to do something different and paying respects to the ancestors of this land. I wanted to do something different than had been done for the last 500 years. And yet, even with that intention in my heart, I made the same mistake. I came and I took something and I left. Yeah. So uh, I returned it. And from that moment on, I, I said, I made a promise to myself that uh, all I, I would take nothing and that all I would do from now on would be to listen and to learn. And, um, and so uh, I continued on with that for the rest of the journey. And I think Today, in terms of when we think about the history of being explorers, um, you know, a lot of it was about taking things. It was about finding resources in other countries that we could bring back to the mother country, you know, and it's still going on. But I think it's time for a new sensibility. Um, and I think that hard lesson taught me that sensibility. Uh, at the wow, end of that wow. battle, 40 days later, I was greeted on the shores by the Grand Chief of the Mi'kmaq people, Ben Sillyboy and gifted a feather. Uh, I had no idea uh, that he would be there that day. And what I found out that day as well was they were watching my spot. I carried a GPS spot with me and someone had passed it on and the children in class were following me as I was paddling. Oh, wow. <laughs> and we nice. 
they were following me. And so they saw me get into trouble that day. And they, uh, there was actually a kid in the, in the school, who, in the classroom who filmed it on his phone. And uh, the teacher gets on and she starts speaking Mi'kmaq and she gets in touch with uh, all the boats that are out on the water and let <laughs> them know that I was in trouble. And um, fortunately for me, I didn't need any help. I had made it to shore. The winds and the winds and the waves, like I was traveling at 9, 10 K an hour, which is quite fast wow. in a canoe. <laughs> yep. Anyway, yep. Uh, but, you know, here again is a perfect example of I thought I was alone in that moment of fear. But actually, unknown to me, there was a classroom with Mi'kmaq children in Wakagama, and they were not only watching me, but they were getting ready to come and save me. And wow. so <laughs> weeks later, when I finished that journey and I met the Grand Chief, uh, I was extremely touched to hear that story. And yeah, he also shared another incredible piece of wisdom with me. Uh, also shared to you by Paul Daniel of, um, and another another Mi'kmaq elder in uh, in the, in uh, in that area. Anyway, member two, um, and both those men said the same thing to me, and which is, you know, traveling the old way isn't the way that you're traveling. You think you're traveling the old way because you're canoeing and you're hiking and you're snowshoeing, but when our people and I'm, you know, when um, traveled, he said, like, you know, our travel people have been traveling for thousands of years <laughs> and, uh, you know, they would often go and might not ever come back or could come back 10 years later. And, uh, and the old way of traveling, it wasn't. Oh, we have just lost internet with yeah. Diane, but what do you think, Carl? She'll be right back. I hope so. I'm like, I'm just waiting to hear her next part of the story. Yeah. What and Great that rock day. that rock story, right? Where it picks up a rock and then she goes, the bad weather comes in and drops yep. that rock off. I mean, we've had that's similar to to some of the stories that we've met with other people where that's sort of, you know, that you take something, you put it back, and then everything changes to a, a, a positive influence. So, you know, what the reason is and why, we have no idea. But that, that's a very cool and that's the beginning of our stories because when we were reading on uh diane's background of that uh mm -hmm. some of the elders calling she's met and some of the stories she shared uh within the the first nation communities is absolutely spellbinding and this is where we don't have the records that we need to have um from our uh canadian first nation elders so i i thought that's another thing i'm, I'm hoping we touch on yeah for sure i mean the just like you say to sit down and talk to these elders that have had uh you know millennials of uh, experience and knowledge passed down through the generations and uh it would just be amazing to hear what they'd have to say and their their theories and yeah. aspects and yeah it would be absolutely amazing i mean you can't even uh with diane she's w w she's building this uh this indie film which i can't wait to see and I, i'm mm -hmm. gonna I know we're both a big supporter of it, but it's going to have some phenomenal landscape. It's mm -hmm. going to have some phenomenal wildlife and it's going to have some phenomenal insight from our first nation when it comes to culture, dance, language, and art. So mm -hmm. there's so many benefits that's coming up in her film, the 500 days in the wild. And then not only that, it's like the cherry on the Sundays. Uh, we're not going to tell this just through a visual format, but we're going to tell it through a book format. So that's where yeah. you get the, you know, the little, a lot more of the insight within a book book format but when mm -hmm. on the word usage, I guess is what they call it. Uh, so there's a double whammy coming down the pipeline. You probably want to read the book before watching the, the movie. Yeah, I, it's usually a, a good idea. Well, I don't know because it, Maybe. Might, even, it might spoil the movie. That's a thing. Do you spoil oh, yeah. You know, spoiler alert. You got to decide which one you want to sort of take with that. Right. Yeah. True. Yeah. But what an experience is an uh, unbelievable. Like yeah. we haven't seen nearly enough of the Trans Canada Trail, obviously. Nope. I mean, we need to uh, nope. go on a we've few seen, more adventures. We've seen pieces of it when we run across it. Sometimes we'll get little <clears> pieces <throat> like we ran into it pretty much everywhere across the province and territories. Yeah. But it's always just like the trailhead and maybe we'll do the five kilometer or 10 kilometer, 15 yeah. kilometer stint. But what Diane has accomplished as the first person to do land, lake, river, and yes. hike uh, is phenomenal. And just to get to those spots that are like in the middle of nothing, you yep, know, not yep. near the communities, not uh, 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, it's so beautiful, the story she has to tell. And it's so beautiful that she's complimenting it with a film and she's complimenting it uh, with a book and she's complimenting it with her interviews. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very exciting. Oh, Diana's back. So enough of you and me talking and bragging okay. about Diane. I'm out of here. I, yeah. I think we should let Diane talk about herself. So Look. we're going to get rid of you right now and we'll bring I'm up done. Diane. And here she comes. Welcome back, Diane. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Technical issues there on the behalf of 500 Days in the Wild. Thank you, gentlemen, for holding the show. As oh. I was saying, the lesson that I learned from, you know, the Grand Chief anyway, was that it didn't matter the way you travel, like the snowshoeing or whatever. The old way is what you carry in your heart. And he told me, and again, this was like four months into the journey, right? That with every step yeah. on the earth to say the earth is sacred, the earth is sacred. With every paddle in the canoe, with every stroke in the water to say the water is sacred, the water is sacred. And he said, that is the old way of traveling. And if you do that, you'll be safe on your journey. And knock on wood, gentlemen, six years nice. out there. And my canoe never flipped and I never got hurt and I never got sick. So wow, I would like to say I took Ben Silly Boy's advice. He's, yeah. he's passed now, actually. I returned to his funeral, but he was uh it was great advice. And these are the subtle differences, um, you know, that are quite have such profound sort of implications um in personal philosophies, right? And so mm -hmm. much about our time and nature is what we carry in here, you know. Even mm -hmm. animals can pick up on that human resonance. You know, um, are you carrying mm -hmm. fear? Or are you carrying love? Are you carrying awe and inspiration? What is it that you carry in your heart? Because yeah. what you carry in your heart shapes your journey. Oh, I, see, uh, I, can't, another, I, I another, can't keep up with these. Nice, nice. I mean, it ain't my. It's not my wisdom, my friend. It's the wisdom I learned on the trail, and uh, yeah. I don't, I'm, I'm not. I was the fool yeah. on the trail. I'm the woman that lost three tents and, or no, six tents in three months. Yeah, and some of this is going to be touched on in your book and your film, which is going to be awesome. I mean, I, that's the. It's it's not only the the educational and the beautiful scenery and the philosophy and the tradition that we're talking about we're, we're going to talk about human blunder human trials human yeah. enjoyment i mean it's gorgeous it's a real film it's not a hollywood it's a real film it's definitely i want to see the blooper reel yeah <laughs> yeah the blooper reel is actually 18 plus the blooper reel is whenever i put the gopro in the inappropriate place i tried to use GoPro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I got like the down the shirt view. So yeah, uh, the blooper reel, reel will be 18 plus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Diane, with, you know, some people, they're going through sort of a branding, I guess it's Trans Canada Trail or is it the Great Trail? I'm not sure which one they're running with right now. But the one thing that I really caught on when I was reading about your story and your journey through life earth and people is you describe as an ecological and reconciliation pilgrimage i mean just yeah. those four words are such an interesting combination of how you described it so maybe you can give us a little background of what this ecological and reconciliation pilgrimage is sure well um I guess I could say that the pilgrimage aspect of it, people have been going on pilgrimages for millennia. Um, and um, my grandmother did one in the 1930s to find hope. Um, one of her 14 children was, was, um, was going to have his leg amputated and uh, she knew they had no education. They didn't know how to read or write. And without his leg, he would be in deep trouble. This is 1930s, you know, in a small town in New Brunswick. Yeah. She made a pilgrimage to a church in Quebec that she uh and with her son to heal him. So I would say that she went on a pilgrimage for hope and um it was successful and that was actually the last reported miracle in St. Angelo Pre ever ever recorded. Um no, so I grew up with a ideological conflict with the Catholic church as a woman, of course, in the seventies and eighties, because I didn't come from the rib of a man. I came from the womb of my mother. And until somebody takes a biology course, I'm not returning. But <laughs> for me, for me uh, what's sacred is nature is sacred, you know, and yeah. uh, for me, what's sacred is the cathedrals. And I say this with all due respect for people in all religions. I think we have to find spirit 
and you find it where you need to find it, but find it because it's a part of who we are. For me, it's in nature. And uh, so the ecological pilgrimage was this, you know, search for hope and wisdom in nature on this journey, on this path. The reconciliation mm -hmm. part of it was, of course, to pay my respects to the ancestors of this land and to the indigenous people in Canada. And every morning um, I smudged. I was gifted a feather from a, a man in, in Haida Gwaii named Vern Williams before I left, a couple months before I left. And I asked him, I said, how can I honor the indigenous people of this country on my journey? And he's taught, he gifted me a feather. He taught me how to smudge. And, and he told me to say a prayer every morning for the missing and murdered Indigenous women. And, and so that was my quiet prayer every day uh, on this journey. It wasn't something that I shared about because it was my private moment. It was my, it was my sacred. Yep. And, um, and so that's, that's what I didn't realize was that those silent prayers would shape my journey and shape my trip. Uh, which they did um wow. i went on to have you know until COVID hit i spent time in every province with indigenous communities uh the Mi'kmaq, the dene the ojibwe in ontario the Mi'kmaq, the maliseet um yeah the dene in the north the the metis a uh, standing buffalo cree uh in saskatchewan um and um and when COVID hit out of respect i went into no communities um, and in fact, at that point in time, my journey shifted quite a bit um, because uh, uh, my partner, uh, Louisa, she um, left her home, bought the supply, a support van, which is what I'm sitting in right now, um, and followed me on the trail for the last year and a half and resupplied me nice. so that I wouldn't have to go into communities um, and wow. so continue to do this. So I tell everybody, guys, that the, the, the currency of 500 Days in the Wild is human kindness of strangers, friends, cousins, uh, and love. I like it. I nice. like it. That's I, 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 got done. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, and what a, what a, awesome support and commitment from your right? partner to do right. that yeah <laughs> she's bad ass anyway let me tell you about louisa when she wasn't before this part of her <clears throat> journey she was wrenching on 747s and probably on one of the only women that was a you know mechanical engineer working for westjet on 737s and so wow cool played. so she's hardcore oh right. louisa yeah yeah, yeah. We got, okay. we got, you let, you let your partner know she has two bigger fans now. Okay, I will. Well, I like to always talk about behind the shine because, you know, everybody, you know, I always say whenever you see anybody succeed or do something um, and people are giving me a lot of attention right now for what I achieved, but yeah, behind the shine, man, because behind the shine are all the people that made that achievement possible. And on yeah. uh, you know, that last 20 minutes, my I finished the journey in Victoria with the uh, paddling the Salish Sea. And that last 20 minutes of my paddle, I was bawling. Just couldn't stop myself. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I wasn't crying because the journey was over. I was crying because all I could think about in those final 20 minutes was all the people, the hundreds. I can't even number the, the hundreds of people that helped me. Yep. Uh, over the last six years, just random acts of kindness, mostly. And, uh, and, and, you know, it, it's easy to believe that we live in a world full of sociopaths when you watch the news, because we give shadow <laughs> the front page of the newspaper and we give shadow the lead story mm -hmm. on the news, you know, but the reality mm -hmm. is shadow is a small bit player taking up mm -hmm. way too much space, man, yep. because, mm -hmm. you know, the 99% of the people out there, 99.99% .99 of the people out there are kind. Yep. They really are. They got yep. big. Absolutely. Yep. And uh, yeah. So, so tell me about this travel, the old way, the slow way of the, the turtles, seeking way. wisdom for those that live close to the land, asking the question. And this yeah. is the question. What have we forgotten? What do we need to know? So what is, what are these questions? What, what, how important is it that we get to understand these two questions? And what did you mean by asking those questions? Well, those, thanks. Those are good questions, Greg. Um, those questions come from, in addition to making 500 Days in the Wild, a feature film, I collaborated with an artist based out of Halifax named Dan Verrill, who also helped me for years on 500 Days in the Wild. 
uh, key creative really for five years. Um, but we decided that in spending time in these communities, they deserved more than two minute sound bites in the feature film that there were. And, um, you know, in order to, so we created the Beacon Project and the Beacon Project is three TV half hours that you can see on CBC Gem. Two of them are on there right now. One is coming very shortly. And they all were filmed in indigenous communities that are on the trail. And um, while we were there, those we centered the idea of the Beacon Project around asking those questions, asking elders, what do we need to know and what have we forgotten? Um, and um, a lot of it was just about listening. Um, clearly, they have a very clear understanding of what Western culture is about because they've been born and raised in it. And they have tried to hang on to their own culture. And I'll tell you what I witnessed over the last six years it was an incredible, um, I kept telling everybody, there's an incredible renaissance happening right now in Indigenous communities in this country. People mm -hmm. are healing. People are reclaiming their language, their culture, their dance. And I think they realize, too, that um, <coughs> they have a lot to contribute right now, even just oh. philosophically, right? Um you know, nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And mm -hmm. clearly uh, what COVID has demonstrated, but also what climate change is, is, is demonstrating is that there are no boundaries from outer space. You know, we really are all in this together, you know, on little planet Earth. And they keep pointing those telescopes and sending their rovers to Mars. But baby, I don't want to live in any of those other planets. Nope. I don't know about you. <laughs> this is the jewel in the in the crown right here. You know, this yeah. is Eden. We have everything we need to survive here. Yeah. And um and so I think that with the philosophies and the and the teachings that I'm still very much um I would say I started in preschool and maybe I'm in grade five now in terms of getting <laughs> education, yeah, yeah. you know. Um so there's still lots to learn and I and I don't want to overstep, you know, um what is right for me to talk about and what people need to hear directly from from the elders themselves. But that, you know, there is a big difference between living upon and living with. Yes. One word, living upon and living with. And, you know, mm -hmm. what we forget as humans is that we are 0.001% of all life on Earth. Think about that. 0.001%. Yeah. People are always asking me, weren't you lonely out there? And I was like, no, I was never lonely out there because I was connecting to the other 99.99% .99 of life, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yep. like, like many days, I look like Tom Hanks talking to Wilson. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a brilliant comparison. That's right? a, I yeah. was, one. I was. Yep. I'd be talking to a tree, or I'd be talking yeah. to dragon. Yeah. The dragonflies are were my Jedi warriors. I I love the dragonflies because they eat the mosquitoes. Yep. I like to tell everybody, you know, like I, you know, I I did. I I loved connecting to all the other life forms except for. The mosquitoes, the ticks, and the black flies. I, I never developed a love for any of them. And uh, so I failed I failed the Buddhism 101 right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, somebody's grandmother there. I know. So how many ways can you kill a mosquito? <laughs> yeah. um, oh, anyway. Uh, you're wow. right. So, um, so anyway. before we let you go, Don, this has been an absolute joy. Oh, uh, before we let you go, is there anything, uh, the floor is yours. Is there anything you'd like to share with our audience today and in the future, uh, before we unfortunately have oh, to part wow. ways, uh, For but now. is there anything you'd like to, um, to share with our audience before we, we unfortunately have to let you go. Okay, well, I'll just say one. I'll say for sure that what we're leaving the world in terms of creating the longest trail in the world, you know, world here in Canada is an incredible legacy for the future. We live in increasingly privatized times, right? Where land and everything is being bought and privatized, bought and privatized. So the idea of this trail that's for free, that anybody from any income bracket um, can access and use and connect with, I think is an incredible legacy to leave the future. And there's an incredible amount of opportunity out there in terms of tourism, in terms of small business. Um, this trail has just been born. You know, it's just a little baby trail. It's the longest trail in the world, but it's a little baby trail. And, you know, we should be inspired by the Camino and by the you know yep. Pacific Crest Trail and, and the, you know, Appalachian Trail um, that 
to to see how what possibilities can be there in terms of how we might uh, how the trail might grow, and mm -hmm. we need to protect it. You know, a lot of people have worked really hard to create this trail, and already parts of the trail are being usurped. So it's really important. It's not just for us. And after six years in the wild, I can tell you the one thing that became really obvious to me was we don't owe the future and economy. We owe them clean air and clean water. And uh, I'm going to spend the rest of my career working for those things for everybody. You, you're you're an amazing role model. I am. I could say for me, Colin, we are so blessed that we've had the opportunity to connect on some level with you. And uh, we sure enjoyed having you as a guest, Diane. And anytime you. you have our email, please reach out. And uh, we uh, we look forward to hopefully when the when the when all of this comes to fruition, uh, we'll reach out and bring you back, and you can tell us all about your all your interesting uh, your film and your book and all the things that you're doing. And uh, uh, we'll we'll play a sort of a catch up. How's that? Sound? Right on, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, Sounds thank great. you, Diane. And take hey, care. Safe adventure you. hard. Thank you. So wow. thank you. Yeah. Wow. Hey, call. Yeah. I'm going to lower. Okay. There we go. Oh, yeah. You, gotta, <laughs> you don't want to look smaller than your bigger. No, body. it's a little tiny short person there for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So no. thank you to our guest, Diane Whelan, for yeah. joining us. Hey, call on our virtual studio in the A Travel Talk Show. Watch her film coming out soon, 500 Days in the Wild. Uh, during the show, we have put up all her uh, her social media feeds and her website. So if you had a chance, please make sure you follow, support, like, and watch. Uh, what can you yeah. say? What can you say, Call? Well, don't forget those uh, the mini episodes on CBC Gem. Ah, yes. Good good call. Yeah. I'm going to be following those as an intro to the, uh, the big movie. Yeah, it's a little bit of an intro to that. And then also you can find uh, this interview – uh, with our role model explorer and friend Diane Whelan, who you can see this on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and LinkedIn, and also on Tumblr social media pages. You'll also be able to see it live on our Travel Talk community, which is Canada's only community dedicated to tourism, travel, and exploration of this great country of ours. Uh, businesses, it's very important to take note. You can advertise your tourism business for free on our award-winning, yes, award-winning national and international website. It is the largest in Canada created by the A Travel Marketing Group. And yes, we are the same group, which just was awarded just the last week, Best 2021 Inbound Travel and Tourism Marketing Business by in Canada by Lux Life, six annual hospitality awards. As well as we won the 221 Canada Prestige Award for Marketing Program of the Year in Canada and the BC Economic Development Associate for Best Community Project Award under 20,000 population. So we're trying to do our bit to put a little bit back into our small communities, into tourism and into adventure. It's been an honor. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to do what we love to do, meeting mm -hmm. with people who we do love to meet with. And of course, Junior, we have a guest next week. Do you want me to fly that or are you going to go there? You can go right ahead, dude. Next week, our special guest is award-winning self-improvement author, Dan Lefebvre. Dan is coming to the show and he's going to talk. Our, our, our sort of topic that we want to talk is learning from failures. In the last two years, we've been dealt blow after blow after blow. I believe, Colin believes, and even our guest last, Diane, also uh, touched on it, is you make the best of what you got. You look for the opportunities, the positive moments. You surround yourself with positive people. You support each other in your goals and your dreams and your support system. Dan will be joining us and he'll be sharing with us how we can learn from our failures. So thank you for joining us today. Be kind. And Colin and I, we'll see you.